Hello, everyone. Um, I'm very pleased to be here with Christopher de Belaig, uh, who is here to talk about his wonderful book, The Islamic Enlightenment, The Struggle Between Faith and Reason, 1798 to Modern Times. Um, it was shortlisted for the Bailey Gifford Prize. Um, and I first uh, got to know Christopher's work uh, as a foreign correspondent in Turkey. He was a correspondent in Turkey and Iran. He is um, uh, also the author of a number of other books, which I can, I can say that I have read and can heartily endorse. One is called Rebel Lands, which is about Turkey, uh, Eastern Turkey. And one of the challenges with Turkey is that the language is in, impenetrable and not, not very well known to many. And often from the journalism and the books that you read, um, you don't have a sense of how the people actually talk. And I think that this book in particular has incredible dialogue and detail um, from, from that society, and I, I heartily recommend it. And then his uh, other book, uh, Patriot of Persia, uh, which is about Mohammed Mossadegh, um, is also a wonderful book, um, and I recommend. Um, this book, the new book, uh, the Islamic Enlightenment is, is beautifully written. It's full of uh, wonderful detail, wonderful characters. Um, and I think it is about uh, a subject that we often uh, find ourselves in conversation about, but perhaps do not know the history very well. And I think that the book is, if I'm, if I'm right, and speaking to this question of um, is, does Islam need an enlightenment? Is Islam in some way not modern? And I will tell a story before I start with my first question. When I moved to Turkey in 2007, a secularist Turk, uh, one of the first people I met there, said to me, um, we were talking about Tayyip Erdogan and how he was becoming more and more powerful. And, uh, he, she, and I was asking her why she was so nervous about a former Islamist coming to power. And she said, well, Susie, you don't understand. These people are different from us. They live differently than we do. They haven't had their enlightenment. And so I was wondering um, what you might say to someone who would say such a thing. And welcome. Thank you. Can you hear that? Yeah. Thank you very much, um, Susie. Um, and I should reciprocate also. It's not a question of should. I will because I want to reciprocate and say also how truly wonderful um, Susie's new book is, um, available here. Um, before we start, लेकिन मेरी खोशी की दूसरी एक कारण है यही है कि भारत के लोग फिर भी भारत के लोग हैं बदल नहीं गया बहुत अच्छे लोग हैं बहुत अच्छी जगह हैं और मेरे दिल में भारत के बहुत बड़ा जगह है I'll, I'll, I'm now going to talk try and respond to this, um, to this question. I too have had lots of conversations of that kind. Indeed, the reason why I wrote the book, the reason why this first um, sparked itself in my mind is because as a foreign journalist living in many places, many of them um, Muslim or Muslim majority or Muslim minority, I was constantly being told by Western experts that the problem with this place and the problem with these people is that they've never had their enlightenment. And to begin with, when I was a young journalist, I accepted this on trust. Yes, Voltaire and Rousseau and um, the philosophers and Newton uh, and everything that we associate with the Western enlightenment didn't happen. But then I started to imagine what it really meant to have an enlightenment. And I started to see that a lot of what was said with respect to many Islamic countries was in fact a gross distortion of the facts. And I was curious when you, you, t you were uh, mentioning why you decided to write this book. I mean, has there been a book that sort of addresses this issue directly? Has it been written before? When you surveyed the literature, what, how did people tend to write about this question? Well, Albert Hurani, um, who was a, a famous Oxford scholar, wrote a book called Arabic Thought in the Liberal Age. 
And he confined himself to the Arab world, whereas my book uh, takes in Cairo, Istanbul, and Tehran as the three major catalyzing areas of the Middle East over the course of the 19th and 20th century. His work was a work of incredible erudition. He had problems with the title, The Liberal Age. How far could you say that it was a liberal age? And I've constantly been questioned about the title of this book, The Enlightenment. Is it applicable to the Islamic world? Or is it a contradiction in terms? I also use words like modernity or progress. Um, for some people, I use them too loosely because I don't want to get too bogged down in definitions. But what I mean to say is that from 1798 to 1980, which is the period that I cover in the book, there, were, there was an entry of new and modern ideas to a degree that is stunning and astonishing to many people in the West. It may be that in India, there is a greater appreciation. The Muslims of India were to some extent undergoing their enlightenment at the same time. They were working through their um, interpretations of modernity. But for us in the West, it is a huge surprise to hear some of the things that took place, the people, the words that were spoken, the actions that were taken by an area of the world that many people still believe is resistant to change. You have a, a wonderful quote in the book where you say, um, there is something wonderfully earnest and wholly irrelevant about Western, Westerners demanding modernity from people whose lives are drenched in it. Um, and I'm just wondering, what do you think that those Westerners imagined that these lives were like? What were sort of pre-modern Islamic countries, Islamic lands like? I mean, wh what was their relationship, the individual's relationship to God, for example? I mean, what were people imagining? In well, there's a, there's a lovely book, a very famous book about Constantinople, which was written by Edmondo da Amicis, uh, an Italian writer. He was already quite well known when he came to Constantinople uh, in, I think, 1860. And he writes this beautifully scented, wonderfully evocative, highly exotic portrait of Constantinople, the harem, all of the old practices still going on, the quaint, the picturesque, all these lovely scenes, these snapshots from a kind of um, sepia photograph of the Istanbul past. What he forgets to mention in this account is that he was in Constantinople for one week and I think this is somehow symptomatic. You find people, particularly writers, but also diplomats, also um, soldiers who were brought in to help uh, local ru rulers modernize their army. They needed to justify their existence. And they, they did so by saying, we're here because these people need us, and they need us because they're so backward. And so they miss out this extraordinary um, uh, roller coaster of change that was going on around them. And can we just first outline, just so that we understand, I mean, what are the things that are included under the umbrella of modernity, just so that we... Um... Well, there's a, there's a paragraph towards the beginning of the book where I try and sum things up. This will always, it will always be an imperfect paragraph, but I, I try and say that the Enlightenment values include, they're not confined to, but they include um, the rising importance of the individual with respect to the collective, to the community. The diminishing importance of the priest, or the sheikh, or the mullah. The uh, ability of people to use new technologies autonomously, people deciding their own way, deciding how they will use these new technologies, and also expressing themselves in a new way, but also we find the emergence of something called a nation, people coming together in a new formation, not simply dividing themselves according to Islam and Christianity and Judaism, but coming together as Turks, as Egyptians, as Iranians. And I, I, I begin the book in a slightly surprising way by quoting from Jane Eyre. And in this section of the book, Jane Eyre is a young teacher. She teaches at a boarding school in England in some, somewhere around 1820. We're not entirely sure when. And she's thinking, I don't want to be at this boarding school anymore. I want to do something else. And she says, right, if I want to get a new job, what I'm going to have to do is put an advertisement in the newspaper, the local newspaper. I'm going to have to give an address 
so that anyone who wants to engage me can send. Um, that will be the post office. Then when I get a response, I will have to get on a, uh, a, a four-wheeled carriage that will take me across pa uh, along paved roads across England to where, wherever I'm taken on. This is indeed what happens when she gets taken on as a governess. Uh, and this is the hinge on which this entire novel swings. And I ask the question, at that time, the time in which that book is set, 1820, what would Jane Eyre have meant to a Middle Eastern Muslim audience? And the answer is, she would have meant nothing. Because literacy across the Middle East was somewhere around 3%, let alone female literacy. Because there was no post office, because there was no newspaper, and because the idea of a woman taking it upon herself to leave her current employment and go somewhere else would have been utterly scandalous. So the answer is, there would have been no Jane Eyre. Um, you more or less start the book with Napoleon's arrival in Egypt. I think this is how you would characterize how modernity arrived in the Middle East um, in, the, in the late 18th century. What was the significance of his period there? What, what were the Egyptians encountering for the first time? There's a, there are two interesting sheikhs who, who wrote about this period. Egyptian sheikhs, and when the French arrived in 1798, they completely obliterated the Egyptian army, or the Mamluk army, uh, in a matter of a couple of hours, with very few casualties. They took control. Napoleon was Napoleon, a showman. He was pretending to be um, on the verge of conversion. He was, he was um, having, entering into close relations with the sheikhs, but they were deeply, deeply distrustful of him, and, and rightly so. These two sheikhs went along to the Institute of Egypt that the French set up, and essentially it was to show off the achievements of the Enlightenment. And so you could go in there and you would experience your first um, experience of electricity. You would see um, treaties or investigations into the spinal curvature of a crocodile. You would see portraits of the Prophet Muhammad. You'd never seen that before. It was shocking, but also thrilling. And you would see the beginning of what became an incredible encyclopedia of Egyptian knowledge, which Edward Said later on said, consigned the whole of Egypt to a department of French learning. Now, one of the sheikhs who went along to this was called Sheikh al-Jabarti, and he was deeply distrustful. He was a stick in the mud. He was a traditionalist, but he recognized that something in his society, in his culture, would have to change because of this extraordinary challenge that had been laid down. He also had seen what happened at the Battle of the Pyramids when the Mamluk army was destroyed, and he knew that in military terms, um, there had to be a complete overhaul. Otherwise, Egypt would again become subjugated. The other one was a sheikh much younger called Sheikh al-Attar. And Sheikh al-Attar just fell in love. He just loved everything about French learning. And he loved it so much that when the French left, he was forced out of the country because it was dangerous to have been a collaborator with the French. He went to Turkey, he went to Syria, and he came back and by the time he came back, Muhammad Ali Pasha um, had taken over and became the first of our great Middle Eastern modernizing um, leaders. And great, I mean that in both senses of the word. A big man, a big vision, but also a dictator. And he saw Hassan al attar and he said, I'm going to promote you. And he was promoted. And he became the, the head of Al-Azhar, which was the, uh, and remains, the great school of Islamic learning in Cairo. And Hassan al attar came up against all sorts of entrenched attitudes. His attitudes were full of newness, full of enthusiasm for the new, but also, crucially, he drew on Islamic learning in the past. Because the Islamic enlightenment isn't simply about taking what the West has to give. It's also about recognizing what is universal in that Western message and finding it way back, 500 years ago, in the Islamic past, that same sense of inquiry. The one concrete thing I think that Hassan al attar did achieve, because he had a lot of opposition, was that he issued a kind of ruling, not quite a fatwa, but it was crucial if, if Egypt was to have a functioning medical profession that theaters of anatomy be allowed to open. And of course, as we all know, the Prophet Muhammad said, you cannot cut up a dead body because he or she will feel every incision. 
But Hassan al-Attar delivered his ruling, and so gradually these theatres of anatomy started um, to appear in Egypt, and medicine took off. Because to begin with, it was the military that mattered, but if you have a military, well, you need to have a medical corps, and all of these things come in the train of that initial reform. Um, just uh, wanted to go back to something you mentioned. It's this idea that they were also finding these commonalities between the, the Enlightenment and Islamic inquiries of thought. You, do, do you ever imagine, while you were writing the book, sort of what sort of modern world they would have imagined for themselves had they not had this sudden clash? Uh, I, I, d I definitely have. You, the, one of the fantasies is if the Islamic world had been left on its own, then how would it have developed? And I think the fact that the Mo Muslim Middle East at the end of the 18th century was in such a poor state in many ways in terms of um, the cloisters, the, the Islamic schools had closed themselves off to a lot of new knowledge. The old enthusiasm for philosophy had been closed down. Um, Free, um, free will had been downgraded in favor of determinism and fatalism. So the state it was in, the Islamic world, was itself a reaction against the rise of the West. And I think one of the most important factors is that there was no printing press. And so that crucial vector for the dissemination of knowledge, the printing press, had been declared illegal, what, in the Ottoman Empire, the early, in, the early in the early 1500s, and it had remained illegal for all except the religious minorities. And again, this is something that Muhammad Ali Pasha brings in. He introduces the first, um, uh, the Quran is set into type in the Middle East, in Arabic, for the first time ever, in Bulak, outside, um, outside Cairo. And then there's this massive translation movement which starts. And so these Books are coming in from France and Germany and England and elsewhere, and they're translated. And gradually, a reading public starts to appreciate this, um, uh, what has been happening in the outside world and the ideas that animate modern Western ideas of progress. I was curious because I, I think I was a little bit surprised to discover this. Um, so the Ottoman Empire had a lot to do with shutting down sort of the golden age of Islam as, as, we, as we hear about it this, and this sort of pursuit of knowledge. I mean, what was going on with the sultans, with the Ottoman Empire in particular, that was reactionary? I'm, to point the finger at the Ottoman Empire would in some ways be correct, but at the same time, the dependencies of the Ottoman Empire, for example, Egypt, which, as you know, was operating almost independently, autonomously, was also um, set against. I mean, the, the country that, that Napoleon discovered in 1798 was in many ways medieval. Um, Iran, not part of the Ottoman Empire, also um, had essentially since the beginning of, of the 18th century been untouched by the currents of, of, of world history because the Afghans had come in, there was a certain amount of chaos on the Persian plateau, and so there, there, was, there was barely a functioning state, let alone the chance to articulate and think about ways of, of progressing, about making people's lives better. People were just trying to stay alive. Um, one of the other, in, an idea that runs throughout the book and that is really fascinating to tease out because it has a lot of relevance to today as well, is that obviously one of the reasons why um, people might have been conflicted about the arrival of these new ideas was because they were coming from the West, they were coming from outsiders, and they were often violently imposed, which is also a modern, <laughs> with modern forms of violence. So how did people have to reconcile these things? Because they had to survive, they had to defend themselves. So that was also what, in a way, encouraged them to, to adopt some of these new practices. It's, it's fascinating. Um, you, that's, that's absolutely right. This was, a, this was an emergency operation to save the Middle East from complete all-out Western control. But the only way to do it was to become more Western. So that's a kind of, this kind of dilemma running through the minds of each and every thinker, uh, journalist, uh, reformer, feminist. Every single one has to juggle this in, in their mind. And one of the ways that, that they got around this was to find within the texts of Islam support for innovation and change. And there is within, the chain, within Islamic texts a great deal of support for that. You have to interpret it in the, in the right way. 
we get to the point where Muhammad Abdul, who was a chief mufti of, uh, uh, of, um, in Egypt at the turn of the 20th century, was ruling that, um, uh, that the payment of interest on, um, for, uh, for insurance purposes was licit. He was saying that um, Muslims um, living outside Muslim countries could, under certain conditions, eat um, non-halal meat. They could wear Western brimmed hats. He was corresponding with Tolstoy. He visited, he took the waters in Switzerland. He was an extraordinary man, um, but he went too far. Um, and as a result, his, his, um, his career was destroyed. But along that way, between 1798 and Muhammad Abdu, we find um, so many people reconciling themselves on the one hand, with Western ideas, they say that they're universal. And on the other hand, with the fact that you can find justification within the Islamic text. So, for example, one of the major problems is the plague. 200 years after the last major outbreak of the plague in Western Europe, uh, um, the Middle East is, is ravaged. Um, in 1832, something like 200,000 people died from the plague in Constantinople alone, in Istanbul alone. It's a major um, impediment to all sorts of things. In 1814, you find um, the consul, the French consul in Piraeus, remonstrating, begging one of the, um, one of the um, Muslim sheikhs there. He's saying, the plague is up the road. It's going to be here in a few weeks' time. You've got to think about fumigation. You've got to think about quarantine. People have got to stop mixing in the, in the bazaars. People have got to um, start taking measures. And the sheikh stands up and says, if this is what God wants, then who are we to stand in his way? And yet, in the middle of the century, there is sufficient support among the sheikhs and the mullahs for this to change. And there are fatwas given, and they're supported by um, coercive modernizing rulers, um, uh, Muhammad Ali in, in Egypt, but also Mahmoud II in Turkey. And the extraordinary thing is that this ravage within 10 years is completely eradicated and after that the reactionaries and the opponents are quiet there's nothing they can say it's just gone from 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 the history books um you mentioned feminism and so i wanted to talk for a moment about uh women in the in the late 19th century or 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 sorry the late Yes, the late 19th century. I mean, I think that, again, one of the common assumptions is that at this period, women would have been severely oppressed in the Muslim world. I mean, what were, were there sort of female characters who you encountered who were, would be surprising to, to readers, I think? I think some of the female characters are, are absolutely astonishing. They certainly astonish me. Um, if you think back to the Jane Eyre analogy that I gave you at the beginning of this um, conversation, the, um, to take an example, Fatma Alia, who's a, uh, she was the daughter of a, of a Turkish government official. Um, she grew up um, in the 1850s and 1860s. <clears throat> she, um, her mother didn't want her to learn French. She was desperate to learn French. Her mother didn't want it because that was the route to, to the devil. So she had to do it in secret. Then she was married. Her husband said, you can't write. I don't like you writing. It's not healthy. It took 10 years to overcome his opposition. And by the 1870s and 1880s, um, Fatima Alia was starting to become a major star in this new, completely newly discovered, newly discovered world of Turkish journalism. For Turkish journalism to exist, of course, a new Turkish language had to exist, much simpler, much more direct, much more in tune with the kind of um, uh, actuality that journalism deals with. So she was writing what was in many ways a reformed language, and her audience, well, many of them were women. And so when she started to address um, uh, uh, all sorts of discussions, all sorts of subjects to do with um, the, women's, the, the place of women in Turkish society, she had a lovely phrase. She said, men seem to think that we're long on hair and short on nows. And you, you can just imagine... Um, women in, in, uh, uh, across Istanbul, because of course this was still a, uh, a, 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 an elite pursuit, w literate women were still very much in the minority, but you can imagine people um, latching onto that phrase and then repeating it to other people. And at the same time, novels were starting to be written. She wrote novels about women. And towards the end of her life, here we have the Jane Eyre, 
Um, she was traveling in France. She was traveling to Chicago to the um, World Fair. Um, in many ways, uh, living a life that was similar to those of her equivalents in the West. And there are many other um, characters like her. And she was from an elite family, correct? Was she? I mean, one, one question I had about modernization is that I think, and this is something that we still talk about today as well, is that some people benefited from it more than others in the newly created nation states. So Turkey, Egypt, Iran, it was different in different ways. But this is one of the problems. Not everybody had equal access to these modernization projects. Is that correct? I think that's absolutely correct. Um, there, was, there, was, there was strong resistance to start with, and it also meant that people, um, uh, particularly if, well, it might depend on your father or your mother, w what they thought. Um, one of the extraordinary facts is that the first public school, publicly funded school for women in Egypt, which was set up under Muhammad Ali, was a school of midwifery. And he thought that that would be beneficial on all sorts of counts. It would, it would bring in all sorts of ideas about hygiene and cleanliness and also um, uh, prevention of uh, sexually transmitted diseases to women that simply hadn't been told about them. And so um, he set aside a building and a budget was allocated and um, teachers were engaged, some of them from France, and then the word was put out. We've got this wonderful new school of w w midwifery. The doors are open. Ladies, come and join. And no one came. Not a single person came. And so the authorities at the school were reduced to going to the slave market, where they bought Abyssinian uh, and Sudanese slaves. And so the first women in Egypt to be educated by the state in the modern era were Abyssinian and Sudanese slaves. If you fast forward 100 years, or even less, 80 years, to the f first years of the 19th century, <clears throat> you're finding that a new class of bureaucrat middle class has come up and that it has now stopped being unacceptable to educate your daughter. It has started to become unacceptable not to educate your daughter. The point you mentioned about the, this being an elite project is, is absolutely true. But where the elite goes, the rest, of the, uh, the rest of the country generally follow. And I found this, in the course of the book, most graphically um, illustrated in a bit that I write about Said Qutb, who's generally associated with reaction against the Enlightenment project, um, one of the guiding forces be be behind uh, modern uh, militant Islam. But he writes in his memoir that he grew up in an untouched rural idyll uh, on the floodplain of the Upper Nile. The kind of place where an enchanted place, a place where beliefs figured, they, they swirled through Islam, uh, folk beliefs, uh, fear of the dark, fear of inauspicious auguries, all of that was part of his childhood. And of course, the annual flooding of the Nile. But into that comes schools. There's a new government school. Are you going to send your son to that? It's got blotting paper, it's got pencils. Are you going to send him to the kutub, which is a couple of guys who know roughly the Quran and are going to teach your kid nothing else but that? Or the government sends the new Ministry of Health are sending men around with syringes. What are they doing here? A lot of people flee, but those who stay, ah, oh, this, this syringe is actually nothing nothing to fear. It's going to, make us, uh, it's going to make us stronger. It's going to protect us against, against disease. And so even into this um, deeply provincial, deeply rural, ostensibly untouched place, the, 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 the ideas of modernity enter. And so I think that that can be, that can be sort of rolled out across, across the whole story. It, it, it will get there eventually in one shape or form. Um, there was obviously a period in the beginning of the 20th century of sort of rapid and, and violent uh, modernization um, that was usually gave or was at the hands of um, a few great modernizing men. Um, and part of the reason why they did have to, I mean, the belief at the time was that they had to enforce modernization on, on everybody, in Turkey, for example. Um, do we know how people reacted to that in the sort of, you have to dress a certain way, you have to adopt a certain language? Did they rebel or did they accept it? Did they want it for the most part? 
Um, I think in order to answer that question, I'm just going to take you back 20 years before then to a moment that I, probably echoing Albert Hurani, called the liberal moment in the Middle East. And I mean liberal, um, approaching really the meaning that I would use in a Western context. Within a very short period of time, Turkey and Iran had constitutional revolutions. There were demands for representative government, electoral politics came into being, and there's an extraordinary quote from the British uh, minister in Tehran, um, back to the Foreign Office in London, saying, it's extraordinary, in all the provincial towns, people are taking over the governorate. They're getting rid of governors that are not popular and they're installing their own. It's like some kind of gra grassroots um, uh, revolution is taking place. In 1909, it's, something, it's almost like something in the French Revolution. Sheikh Fazlullah Nouri, who's a reactionary um, mullah, is publicly executed. This is like something out of the terror in Paris. Really radical, radical things are taking place. In Turkey, another constitutional revolution. The Egyptians are moving along, although they've been colonized by the British, they are um, moving along in their demands, not only for independence, but also for um, taking powers back from, from the crowned head. This liberal moment stopped, and it was reversed. And I think that the factor or the event that did most to reverse it and did most to create um, the conditions under which um, the Islamic world or the Middle Eastern world has evolved since then was the First World War. Because the First World War, I mean, the Western Front, 3.5% um, death rate in France in the First World War. We don't know for the Middle East, but one of the educated guesses that has been made is 20%. And everyone thinks that, oh, the Middle East was somehow outside the First World War, not a major player at all. But you had armies crisscrossing vast areas. And when armies crisscross in a state of war, then it's the, it's the population that um, end up suffering. So the, demogra the demography, the topography, everything, the, the political landscape was completely turned upside down in the First World War, after which we had a lot of promises about independence, about self-determination, um, the 14 points, um, and all of that. And, and these promises were glaringly not carried out. Uh, Turkey escaped uh, subjugation, colonization, only by the skin of its teeth. Iran, only by the skin of its teeth. And the rest of the region, including Egypt, was, of course, under, col under colonial control. And this led to what you're referring to, which is that coercive modernization, um, which we see in its best and purest form in Turkey and in Iran. And what that meant was things are now really serious. We got to get with the program very, very quickly. So we're going to give us 10 years to industrialize, um, bring our women out of Perda, um, uh, educate everyone. Um, everyone's going to look differently, think differently. It's all going to be different. And again, I believe that this was largely a defensive measure. And of course, it was horribly misguided because there was a reaction. And there was a reaction against the arbitrary nature of these decisions. There was a reaction um, in Iran, for example, against the contempt that the ruling dynasty had for the Shia Islam, um, for the beliefs of the majority of the people. And in Turkey, despite the fact um, that Ataturk um, was in many ways a considerable and great leader, and he had a plan, I believe, to turn Turkey eventually into some kind of democracy, he too operated a kind of cultural scorched earth policy. And we only have to look at what's happening now uh, and the, the rise of Recep Tayyip Erdogan, who is now um, consciously um, taking what he wants of the Ataturk model, um, becoming bigger than Ataturk in many ways, um, supplanting Ataturk as a, another strong leader, but an Islamist strong leader. So we, we only have to look at what happens later on to see um, where that ends. And I should also mention that the that the Western reports coming out of Ankara and Tehran in those years, in the, in the, in the 20s and the 30s, um, when Turkey and Iran were furiously reforming, were full of praise. There was very little reservation. 
They were doing what they had to do. They should have done it earlier. Thank God they're doing it now. It's interesting when we get into the, the, what you call the counter-enlightenment and there's sort of the response from um, various groups like the Muslim Brotherhood. Um, but there's, it's, it, there's an interesting tension in your book because in some ways it seems as if uh, these groups are calling to return to some other uh, previously held state. Um, and on the other hand, they are quite modern themselves. And I was wondering if you could talk about how they were still sort of negotiating those, those two things in a way. I think that's absolutely right. Um, the Enlightenment or progress or modernity or whatever you want to call these, this combination of, of, of values and principles leave no one behind. Everyone is caught up in them. Whether it be through the use of technology or whether it be because you're emulating an organization that exists in the West. The entry of party politics. It's a Western model transplanted, but then you get Islamist parties coming to power and for many people, there is a question mark as to whether they want to come to power and then get rid of a, a democracy or whether they're truly um, democratic. The Muslim Brotherhood, which came, to, came into being in the 1920s, grew very, very fast. Um, Hassan al-Banna was, um, a lot of that structure was, uh, was modeled on uh, the, the, the missionary groups and the, the, young, um, the young men's Christians association that were also spreading at the time. And... Um, you can look at his total, his total view of religion as a, kind of, um, as a kind of spirit that infuses everything you do um, and see parallels with totalitarian um, governments that were also uh, coming to power at the time um, in Europe. You get to the 1979 revolution in Iran, which is meant to be the great return, the return to the purest form of Islam, but of course, there are constitutions, there are political parties, there are checks and balances. You cannot get away from any of this. And women have a great say in what happens um, in the Islamic Republic of Iran. Uh, and now, of course, technology has yet again transformed the way that people are communicating. The message may be, well, it may be 8th century, or it may seem to be 8th century, but of course, it's not because it's delivered in a way that is entirely 21st century. And this was what was particularly confusing about groups like ISIS, um, because they were, I mean, they were often characterized as the most backward, or they were kind of longing for many, many centuries ago, but they were, they had the most high-tech videos, you know, videos that seemed right off of MTV or something like this. And, um, and this combination was, I think, very confusing to people, wasn't it? Well, I think, I think there's another aspect to this, and that is that... If you go back to someone like um, Muhammad Abdu, I was telling you about the progressive Egyptian priest, turn of the 19th century, he was, he was coming to a position where he said that the lay person would no longer need to go to the sheikh and ask for his advice. So that link, that dependency, that, um, that, that relationship of, of subservience to the sheikh would no longer exist. You will go and do sufficient reading, and we will educate in a, you in a, sufficiently in a modern society to go and take your own decisions. And so now across, um, uh, I remember after the Arab Spring, I did a very hopeful program for the BBC in Cairo, and there were, there were wonderful people who were just saying, saying that they were doing exactly that. Now, if you take that to an extreme, then you get some guy who's, you know, he's read a bit around, he's read a few um, radical um, screeds, and he's watched, uh, he's watched um, uh, some radical stuff on YouTube, and he finds himself in a favorable environment. Well, he can say, well, don't listen to any of the established sheikhs, or Al-Azhar, or any of the great schools of Islam, listen to me. Uh, and this is this kind of radical, this is almost the Reformation. This is almost Martin Luther. And I don't want to labor the point, but I, I, I came across this um, when I once did an investigation of radicalization in French jails, which is an interesting little universe because it's self-contained. Um, the authorities are trying to prevent information, particularly radical information, from getting in. And yet, a radical, charismatic young man can carry so many people with him, given the right circumstances. And so the terror is that um, you're putting um, people at, in danger of radicalization into the environment 
most suited to radicalization. And can I just ask you, I mean, uh, in, in a lot of, with a lot of these movements, including the Brotherhood and, and, and the rest of them, I mean, a lot of it was trying to reclaim, they did, there was a feeling of, of loss, I guess, a certain loss of identity. Um, I think that we tend to see this through the le this lens of, oh, they wanted to be religious again or something like that. But it was, a, it was more complicated than that. There was a loss of sense of who we are, who we are in the world. Is, would you agree with that? I, I would definitely agree with that. I think running through the pages of this book, despite all of the enthusiasm that a lot of these characters have for all the new ideas, there is a deep, deep sense of tragedy, a deep sense of destiny unfulfilled. Because if God came along and created Islam as the final word, then why is Islam not creating the happiness and the fulfillment that we expect from it? Are we at fault? Is Islam at fault? Who is at fault? And so this is one of the reasons why you often get, are the outsiders at fault? And that, that disinclination to interrogate the self, oneself, what, did, what am I doing wrong? So I think that that sense of tragedy, that sense of lost values, and it's not just political, it's, it's also cultural. Things are being casually destroyed, casually obliterated. Physical reminders of, of, um, former, uh, of a former sense of, of self, a former sense of, of serenity, cultural serenity, but also um, those psychological props that people take for granted. And so I think when you're looking, well, particularly at the 20th century, when the pace of change started to simply to get faster, um, you see that very much reflected. One of the characters, um, who's a very interesting Iranian called Jalal al-Ahmad, um, who was never a pious man. He was a big drinker. He visited Israel, um, worked on a kibbutz, um, went to Harvard, um, had a lovely time flirting with international delegates at this conference, drinking beer in the bars with local Boston people. And yet his conclusion was that the Shah's modernization effort was so empty. It was it eviscerated. It just took the insides out of his culture and out of his soul. And so he came around to the idea, well, we, the only thing we have is the mullahs. And so he became, despite the fact that he personally wasn't pious, a supporter of this kind of uh, Islam as, dem as illustrated, as propagated by, by the mullahs. I'm just going to ask one more question while, because I'm, I'm very curious, and I've had people at this festival ask me, you know, where is Turkey going? What do you think is going to happen with Erdogan? And I think people would wonder the same about Iran. Um, after the Arab Spring, you know, at this point, everybody is so incredibly pessimistic about the Arab world. And sometimes I do hear from Arab friends, you know, this is... But they're kind of, in, in a way, also, I mean, obviously, they've been um, in, tr in just a terrible tragedy for the last six years. But at the same time, they find it a little strange to hear people pronouncing, you know, everything sort of dead in the Middle East for them, that, that there's no hope for democracy, that there's no hope for, for stability. Um, how do you feel uh, about things right now in, in the three countries you focus on, at least? Well, I think... I think I'm just going to answer Iran, actually, because you, you know Turkey better than I do. Um, Egypt is... I haven't visited Egypt since I finished the book. Um, and, of, of course, it would be wrong to say it's in deep freeze. Um, but I'm not... I haven't, I haven't got my finger on the pulse. I was in Iran recently. And I was in Iran um, at the time when, um, for a couple of weeks, there were quite significant protests across the country protests that many people compared to earlier protests in 2009, which were much, much bigger. I, I, I find that comparison unhelpful because the protests, there's, there's, and this really comes to the, what you're asking. The protests that happened recently are between the state and people who have given up any hope that the state will reform itself. 2009 was all about, let's reform, let's, let's, let's go out and, and, and reform the country. Now, a system that has a large population that want reform and refuses to reform is in trouble. People of my age in Iran don't want trouble. They've got children, they've got, they've got futures, they've got pasts. They've seen what happened in the revolution. 
They don't want another one. They just want slow, careful baby steps towards reform. But the younger generation, the 18, 19 year olds who maybe don't have jobs, are fully integrated into the world. Um, the information mix that everyone else takes for granted. They are extremely conflicted and some of them are very angry. So that is, that, that, that creates this, um, this potential for, um, well, I don't know what, I won't, even, I won't even hazard a guess, but I'm just saying that that, that creates potential. I understand. Christopher, thank you. I think we can open it up for, for questions, if anyone has any questions. for. In the, in the blue, he had his... Um. Yeah, thank you. Uh, if you can comment on the external forces that led to uh, somehow squandering the enlightenment that happened in the uh, Muslim world. Because much of the things that happened in the uh, Middle East or the whole Muslim world were somehow driven by the external force. You have World, one, world War One, World War Two. How did that impact the, the somehow stopping of this enlightenment? Thank you. I think external forces were important. Uh, a lot of people say, oh, if you talk about external forces, then you're denying people agency. You're saying that basically they have no control over their destiny and you shouldn't do so. Uh, my reading of the historical record is that ex uh, external forces are extremely important and we shouldn't um, hide from that fact. I'll give you uh, one example, uh, which is the, the subject of the earlier book um, that um, Susie mentioned. Mohammed Mossadegh was a, a prime minister who came to power through democ democratic means in Iran. He planned to take back the oil industry which the British had founded, invested in, but w were now, um, well, they were, t they were using to prop up their own ailing economy. Um, he saw this as a, not only as an injustice, but also as something almost spiritual. The oil industry was Iran, it was its resource, and it needed to come back. He failed to agree with the British on this, and so nationalized the oil industry uh, in 1951. And two years later, this man who, was, who came to power democratically, he was a constitutionalist, he believed that the Shah should reign rather than rule, and he wasn't, as his, um, as his enemies painted him, a communist at all. Uh, he was um, probably in favor of a semi-planned economy, as most people were in those days in the Middle East. This man was toppled in a coup in 1953 that interrupted Iran's development, political development. Now, I can't say that Iran, had he stayed, would have become heaven on earth, but I can say that the Shah would not have been able to increase his power to the extent that he did and become uh, this arbitrary despot that we see in the 1970s, bringing his country towards uh, oblivion and the revolution. That's, uh, I think that's, that's a pretty good example of, um, of Western intervention. However, most of us in this, in this room are not from the countries I'm talking about. And the thinkers who I, uh, and the friends who I respect most in those countries are those who say, we also need to look at where we went wrong and where we can take uh, better decisions next time. We can't simply blame the outsider. Um, <laughs> yes, in the black, uh, right here. Uh, hello? Can you also ask this lady in the corner? Oh, sure, sure. Uh, uh, sir, I want to know, like, uh, you know, the case of Iran always fascinates me that in the 1500 odd years that they have been uh, Islamicized, uh, the entire history still points to, like, uh, immense creativity and uh, intellectual output. And uh, their other um, uh, co-religionists in other nations are, like, far behind them. And so this entire history uh, makes me feel that uh, eventually they will move over as a civilization and a nation into a more reasonable form of Islam and uh, especially tolerance and uh, 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 living with other faiths, whether they flourish or not. But I feel given their like uh, that background and, and how intellectual they are. So uh, the future must be, I think, logically like the more reasonable version of Islam and Islamism may not hold. Do you feel that way optimistic?
So, um, if, if, did everyone hear that question? Yeah. Um, is, Islam a, is, is Iran a special case because um, it, it, it somehow has retained this creativity and this intellectual vitality? I would say I would take issue with the, the basis of the question. But I think that some of your conclusions are, are, are right. The basis of the question is that despite Islam, Iran has shown vitality. But if you look at the centuries that followed the entry of Islam, if you look at the Safavid centuries, if you look at the Buids, if you look at, if you go to Iran, you will find that the majority of these enormous, spectacular monuments to human creativity did take place under the Islamic period. And you look at the way that the Persian language was vitalized um, by, by the Arabic language, somewhat similar um, to the way that the English language was vitalized by the entry of French. So I would take issue with that. I think that um, what we're looking at now is Iran is a Shia country, and it is the self-proclaimed champion of the Shias. Shiism has always been more open to a lot of skepticism, skeptical currents of thinking, to philosophy, in a way that from time to time have been closed off in the Sunni world. So that, that is possible. I think, I think that in the long term, I feel um, optimistic about the Iranian future because I actually agree with your conclusion that there is a kind of uh, vitality and a creativity um, that will uh, that will see see through. It, it, at the moment that vitality is still there and it's still visible even in government circles it's just not right at the very top but it's very much there um, the woman in the green here um, let me understand this right okay um, when you say Islamic enlightenment you don't mean European Enlightenment, which is Christian Enlightenment, the model of Enlightenment sort of trudges towards democratic institutions and the way we see forms of government that are at least at some distance from religion, at least theoretically, right? Is that the problem? Are we looking at a form of government that just could not step away from religion? and an enlightenment that one hopes religion would enforce. Is that, does that make sense? Um, is, is, does the Islamic enlightenment mean, is the, enlightenment, is the, is the Islamic enlightenment being um, prevented by an inability to, to, to separate politics and religion? I think I use the word enlightenment more broadly uh, not simply incorporating um, political systems or indeed secularism. I'm also comfortable with the idea that in some countries there will be absolutely no reference to, to religion in politics. In others, there will be some reference to religion. It really depends. This happens in, in lockstep with the, uh, with the um, attachment of the people to religion. Uh, in the West, as people's attachment to religion waned, it became much easier to introduce secular government. If the country is deeply attached to religion, there will inevitably, in some way, shape, or form, be reference to religion in government. But as I said, Islam is almost endlessly open to interpretation. And the law is clear on some things, and it is deeply opaque, and it demands human reasoning for many others. And this, this really is the question. It's whether you take a literalist approach, or whether you say, now hold on, the Quran was created, it is not a part of God, it is a sacred text, but it can be reinterpreted according to today's conditions. And that is what a lot of people in, the, in, in my book, that's been the guiding principle of a lot of people in the book. And we still, we still have that today.
Um, in the back, the, yeah. yeah. Hi. Uh, what are your views on sectarianism in Islam? Um, should we be looking at sectarianism only through theological lens, or there exists a better way of understanding it? Through, through which lens, I'm sorry? Theological. Oh, that's definitely a much better way of understanding sectarianism. Sectarianism is politics. Um, for much of the time that I deal with in the book, the Sunni Shia thing isn't a thing at all. The one character in the book who did come to India, Sayyid Jamaluddin al-Afghani, he moved from Iran, where he was born, to Afghanistan, where he pretended he came from, to India, to Istanbul, to Egypt, to Western Europe, to Moscow. And wherever he went, he was a symbol of something which we now call pan-Islamism. And no one said, oh, he's not one of us. He's a Shia, he's a Sunni. He kept that well to the background. He had much more important things on his mind. And that was the renovation of Islam. It was uh, the defeat of imperialism. All these other subjects were much more important. And if you go up to, I should say, the Suez crisis, you will find that that is the animating spirit. This sectarian poison was much less in evidence. And it is really, I think it's the Afghan jihad that really gets sectarianism going. And it is now this conflict, um, this proxy conflict between um, the Saudis and the Iranians uh, that has resulted in people looking each at each other and wondering whether they're Sunni or Shia. And this was, it was so much less important. And you only have to read um, any of the Sufi poetry um, in whatever language, whether it be Urdu or Arabic or Persian, to find that um, Islam, as practiced by millions and millions of people, really didn't, they just couldn't care less about Sunni and Shia. And there was so much more um, fluidity. I, just to take an example, and this is really one of the tragedies, is that you read travel writing in the Balkans in, at the end of the 19th century, and you find people going from an amazing writer. Um, I, I'll remember his name in a minute. He wrote two volumes. He went from village to village, and he found that in this village, um, the Muslims were borrowing this from the Orthodox. The Orthodox saint that you went to for, to get pregnant, the Muslims were going there as well. And the Jews used to come there, and they used to share each other's holy days. And, they would, and the whole thing was a glorious sort of hodgepodge. And it's when you got this codification, this insistence that you're either this or that, now choose, uh, which partly goes parallel and in tandem with state building because you need to find out who's who, and you've got no room now. It doesn't make a, there's no category for, well, I, on Tuesdays I go to the, um, to the Orthodox uh, church and then uh, on, on Fridays, Fridays I'm in the mosque. There's no, that category doesn't exist. So what I'm trying to say is that sectarianism, sectarianism isn't simply about Sunni and Shia. It's about a general atmosphere of borrowing between faiths between what many people would now call superstitions, and that narrowing down, that insistence on purity, which is one of the reasons why we have so many problems in this um, domain today. Yeah. Yeah. One more. Yeah. Yes, sir. Okay, is that my microphone? I don't know. Hello. Uh, I need to ask, like, how would you divine, uh, define modernity? Like, um, and also I want to know, like, how acquainted are you with Quran, like, and, and Arabic language of the Quran? Uh, and I have this, uh, you know, uh, problem uh, with, the, with the title of the book, like, Islamic in Enlightenment. It should have been, like, a Muslim Enlightenment, rather. Uh, and also there's a dialogue between faith and reason. I've been researching into the Arabic language of the Quran, and uh, I've just found it really uh, reasonable, like, you know, faith, that fa faith itself very reasonable. I, I want to know, like, 
you know about that. The easiest question for last. <laughs> I'm not going to try and answer all of your questions, and I won't satisfy you. Um, I, I'll, I'll try and start at the end. Um, I'm a Turkish reader, and I'm a Persian reader. I'm not an Arabic reader. So I haven't read the Arabic Quran. I've read it in English. Um, the fact that you read the Quran and find something intensely reasonable, I think, reflects upon yourself. And I think for those people who read the Quran and find justification for unreasonable acts, I think it, it reflects on themselves as well. I don't think uh, the, the amount of um, interpretation that people much more learned than I have put into the Quran suggests that it is, as it has been described, a deeply rich and elusive text, allusive. That is to say, it is open to all sorts of interpretations, both grammatically, and that is why we have these enormous institutions of learning arguing and disputing over the right way to read a certain ayah uh, or, or verse of the Quran. Um, but also in its application. And I've spoken to um, Islamic scholars who would, um, whose vision of the world is entirely in accordance with mine, and I've spoken with those whose vision of the world is completely not in accordance with mine. But I should also add that I've spoken to scholars and believers from other faith groups and I can say the same about them. So I return to that original point. I think if you read the Quran and see something eminently reasonable, it is because you're a reasonable person. Thank you, Christopher. Um, I think that's it. I just wanted to say again, this is a really beautiful book, as are all of Christopher's books. I recommend them all. And it's just, um, these are very sensitive topics uh, at a very difficult time. And I think we're lucky to have someone who has spent so much time with the languages, the cultures, and with the history. So thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Susie and Christopher, for being with us here today. Uh, we'd like to present you scarves as tokens of our appreciation.